Welcome to the Climate Diplomacy Podcast, a podcast from the Berlin-based Think and Do Tank Adelphi, bringing you the latest insights and debates in international climate diplomacy and security. We are your hosts, Raquel Monayer. And I'm Alexandra Steinkraus. In this series, you will hear from experts and practitioners offering their take on climate foreign policy, climate-related impacts to security, and promoting peace and resilience in the changing climate. For more information, please visit climate-diplomacy.org or follow at Climate Diplo on Twitter. Hello, and welcome to everyone tuning in. On today's episode of the podcast, we are going to be discussing how transitional justice intersects with environmental concerns in Colombia, particularly within the special jurisdiction for peace. We're really excited to have worked with Justice Rapid Response to put this together. We will be discussing in this episode the challenges of applying restorative justice measures that include the environment, how environmental initiatives can serve as tangible forms for reparation for communities impacted by violence, how some of these lessons learned can be shared within other contexts and conversations, especially in regard to international humanitarian law and transitional justice and more. And hello also from my side. I have the honor of introducing our guests today who will walk us through such an important topic, starting by Valeria Patricia Moscoso Ursua, who is currently deployed by Justice Rapid Response as a psychosocial support expert to Colombia's special jurisdiction for peace. Her role is to contribute to the assessment of harm caused to indigenous and Afro-Colombian communities living on the Caribbean coast. Hi, Valeria. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Hi to everyone. Thanks for listening. And we also have with us today Hector Morales Munoz, who is the Senior Advisor for Climate Diplomacy and Security at Adelphi. And besides working with amazing team colleagues, aka us, <laughs> Hector has also several years of experience with environmental governance and peace building research. And on today's topic, also spent four years working on victims' compensation in Colombia. Welcome, Hector. Hi, Raquel and Alex. Thank you very much for this invitation. I'm really looking forward to this episode. Thanks so much to the both of you for being here. We're really excited to dive into things. So to lay a foundation for this episode, let's start with a little bit of an overview. Colombia is facing multiple challenges, including implementing and monitoring of the peace building process after more than 50 years of armed conflict, as well as the impacts of climate change from floods, droughts and landslides to desertification to rising temperatures leading to increased risk of heat stress for livestock, for crop yields. So Hector, can you start us off today by giving an overview of the peace process in Colombia and what kind of transitional justice and restorative measures are taking place? Yeah, thank you very much, Alex. Thank you for this easy task of summarizing 16 years of conflict in a few minutes. Exactly, just a few yeah. minutes. I know you can do it. So I'm going to make a small definition on transitional justice and restorative justice. And then how this, because this will keep the line of the argument of how this is implemented in Colombia. So, transitional justice is an approach to systematic or massive violations of human rights that both provides reparation to victims, but also creates or enhances opportunities for the transformation of political systems, conflicts, and other conditions that may have been at the root of the abuses. And it originally emerged in the late 80s and in the early 90s in response to political transitions that took place in Latin America. So mm -hmm. from dictatorships to democracy and in Eastern Europe, the transition after communism to democracy, right? So to achieve this ends, transitional justice combines different elements of criminal justice, which is punishment, also restorative justice and social justice. Then restorative justice works in tandem with criminal law, but is also an approach that offers offenders, victims, and the community an alternative to start dialogue, and especially to repair the damage that the perpetrators made to victims. So it is a space where participation and this interaction is highly embedded. So in Colombia, there has been 12 peace processes since 1984, so, as you say, more than 60 years of war, which had left more than 200,000 people dead, 150,000 disappeared, 7 million internally displaced people, 9 million people registered in total as victims. So, it's a huge toll of this hideous war. But 
among these two peace processes, there have been four key milestones with regards to transitional justice. So first, there was a peace agreement with the M19 guerrilla group, which opened the way for our current constitution in 1991, which was a really integrative and diverse constitution after a conservative one. And also as proof of a successful integration process, Gustavo Petro, our current president, was a former M19 guerrilla member. Then the second one is a peace and justice jurisdiction, which was after the paramilitary groups demobilized during the Uribe government. And this brought two key elements. First, an approach to stop following case by case of the violations towards a more macro-criminality approach of transitional justice, because we said that if you follow case by case, it would take 100 years to achieve justice to each individual case. So this was one first movement into this. And the paramilitaries pay between five and seven years of jail. And they have this commitment of telling the truth. And then other two institutions that was the National Commission for Reparation and Reconciliation and the National Center for Historical Memory. Then in 2011, their key milestone was the Victims' Compensation Law and Land Restitution, which has already like an element of environment in it because it's land restitution for victims. And then the fourth one is with the last peace accord in 2016 with the Colombian government and the FARC area, creating something that is called the Integral System of Truth, Justice, Reparation, and Non-Repetition. So it's four elements, which is truth, justice, reparation, for the victims and no repetition. Within this system, there is the Threat Commission, a unit for the search for persons reported missing in the context of the armed conflict, and the special jurisdiction for peace, which has as a goal to satisfy victims' right to justice, provide truth, protect the rights of victims, and a legal security for those who participated directly in the conflict and living there. Now, turning to you, Valeria, having worked with communities, maybe you can tell us how indigenous populations in the Afro-Columbia communities been disproportionately, or maybe to not put the word in your mouth, have been differently impacted by both the armed conflict and climate change. I'm thankful for the new war because, yes, I think one thing to say here is that this kind of crimes and macro-criminality scenarios harm everybody in the region, in the places, in the countries, you know. So one first thing to understand is that the psychosocial impacts that come from this kind of circumstances affect everyone, not ethnic people and Afro-Colombian and indigenous, etc. So everyone has been harmed for this conflict. But the truth is that not everyone feels, lives the harm the same way. Because it depends of your special place in the world, your special place in your neighborhood, in your indigenous community, in different if you live in the mountains, from the coast, a lot of factors. So it is true. It's different, the impact. It's a differential approach that we have to take to address to these communities. They have a lot of psychosocial impacts. A lot of them are similar to the impacts of not ethnic populations. But the truth is that when we talk about indigenous population, Afro-Colombian, people with a really important approach to identity, this identity usually also has a very close relation with the environment. And not only the environment, but also the land. When we talk about indigenous people, We do not talk a lot with this word environment. We talk about with the complex relation with the people, with this land and with the territories, because this is part of a very big and complex cosmovision. We can maybe say worldview, but I think worldview is also a word that doesn't say everything that cosmovision can say. So, of course, it's different impacts because the way that these communities are affected is not only because they were, for example, being beaten. It's because the land is being harmed. It's because the territories are being dispossessed. It's because everything that lives in these territories is being unbalanced. 
That's very interesting that you mentioned because we've learned also from previous work that was looking into the dynamics of conflict in Colombia that land has played a very important role in the conflict as well, both in the sense that you're mentioning, which I guess maybe you can expand a little bit on, but also the more legal sense on land ownership, land use. But these things do intersect. So maybe you can expand a little bit more upon this connection between land, the environment, and indigenous people, and also how this can be properly considered in transitional justice measures. Yes, and I think what you're saying is a really important point in this discussion because in one hand you have uh, indigenous communities that they have like years and years and years of proper legal justice systems that they not necessarily are the same of the Western justice systems that the uh, common states, you know, like the Colombian states or the Mexican state or every state have. So in these indigenous legal systems, they've had for a long, long time a lot of transitional and restorative mechanisms. Maybe they don't call it like that, but they have a lot of uh, ways of recovering the balance and recovering the justice and the sense of justice that they consider was just. So this on one hand. In the other hand, it's true that Western concept of transitional justice not always take in consideration the indigenous people approaches and the indigenous people cosmovision. So we have a mostly Western transitional justice mechanism that comes to the countries and comes to the communities and try to have justice, but with his or her or its uh, point of view, not necessarily talking with the people and understanding and building in between the two world of views. So I think it's really, really important that the Western transitional justice to have dialogues with these other ways, to talk with these communities, not in an unbalanced relation, but peer-to-peer -peer relation. So we can learn from each other and we can learn from the ways that indigenous communities have built justice through the years and we can adjust the transitional justice mechanisms and institutions to really answer to the needs of these communities. That doesn't mean that traditional and Western transitional justice is useful, not, not at all. It's a really important effort from all parts of the world but the truth is that it has to have a dialogue with the indigenous communities. So we do not have a violent approaches again if we are trying to repair and restore violent circumstances. Thanks so much. One thing, just in the short time we've been talking today, it's become very, very clear that the environment plays a role in both of these challenges we've been discussing regarding climate change and conflict, with the drivers of deforestation intertwined with conflict dynamics and land access and unsustainable use uh, being driving forces of both climate change and conflict, and really highlighting the need for these kinds of mechanisms to be decided in conversation with indigenous communities and not only be Western concepts of what these mechanisms look like. As we move further, let's zoom out a little bit in the conversation. And Hector, if you can kind of lay out why it's important for restorative justice measures to include the environment. Yeah, so as Raquel mentioned before, in the Colombian conflict, land is at the root of the conflict, like a combination between access to land and governance of the territory. So in this case, if we see transitional justice as a way to transform and to build peace, even if there is not a total negative peace of violence, every measure that you do through the judicial system to clarify land rights, to have an equitable access to natural resources is contributing to peace, into a stable peace. So um, that is why it's super important that restorative, restorative justice include the environment. And there's also, I would say, two dimensions. One is the environment as a victim of the conflict. And two, the communities that are embedded in this natural environment 
are depending at economic level on access to resources and to a healthy environment, but also at its spiritual identity, social level, they are totally dependent on, on the land. So the land is not only an asset, a productive asset, but they are totally dependent on this and their whole cultural system isn't this. And you can see this, for example, as victims recognize the disproportionate impact on women and indigenous communities. And they say that violations against their territories are as equivalent to violations against the people or equivalent as violations against themselves. So different collective associations of victims have expressed interest in using the labor of the perpetrators as a way of reparation in their communities. For example, they say literally the penalty should not be to lock them up in prison because the truth of what happened in the country will not be known, but rather that the person responsible can live in the community for a period of time. The work should be then free to tell us what happened, who motivated, what happened in each territory, where are you doing such a harm to us, to the environment. So recognizing all these diverse perspectives on the territory in nature is crucial to restore the social fabric that was disrupted due to conflict. And just talking a little bit with Valeria, I think the special jurisdiction for peace has already embedded in its mission an obligation to adopt affirmative measures in favor of marginalized groups. So like ethnic communities, Afro-Colombian communities, and they say that this measure should have a territorial approach that recognizes the needs, characteristics, and the particularities of the territories. And also, they have this capacity to work on projects and activities with restorative content as a way of punishment, so to say, and coupled with effective restriction of liberty. So this is something that is going beyond with the West vision of justice because this special jurisdiction for peace, which is called the HEP in Spanish in Colombia, they have already indigenous judges, Afro-Colombian judges. They also have a parity between women and men, and they're starting this dialogue with the communities and this pedagogical exercise to foster responsibility or recognition. So I think it's a really interesting pathway. Yeah, certainly. To help make kind of some of these points and some of these different discussions a little bit more tangible to our listeners, can you share some examples of cases and how the legal interests of nature, which you've kind of touched upon a little bit, plays a role in some practical initiatives that are ongoing? Yeah, definitely. So I'm going to mention two cases or there may be three cases very quickly. One is in the context of the Truth Commission, which is one of the institutions that emerged after the Peace Accord. And this very interesting exit. So first, the, the Truth Commission has the mission, the objective of make an account of the facts that happened during the conflict, then explain the complexities to the society and find the most responsible people and then trying to explain what really happened in, in a context with deep in-depth research. So they did this study where they concluded that violence against people and violence against land go hand in hand. And this was an analysis of the mechanisms of dispossession of land in a municipality, Turbo in the Antioquian Uruva. So this is like in the border with Panama in the north of Colombia. So if you ever had taste a banana coming from Colombia in Europe or in the US, it most likely comes from this region. They export like 100 million boxes of bananas per year or something like this. So in this municipality, they did a study using video, satellite data, aerial and archive images from 1983 to 2020. And they showed that transnational banana companies, banks, financial institutions, and state institutions, and paramilitaries interacted in a way that resulted in the massive dispossession of peasants. And within this study, there was something really interesting that has to do with our work in, in the Climate Diplomacy and Security Program, because the paramilitaries entered into this village and, and made a massacre really close to the shore. And it was really, really a horrible massacre of more than 20 people in order to acquire land and then afterwards utilize it for monoculture of bananas. 
Now this place is totally underwater due to the erosion and sea level rise driven by climate change. So what the farmers have proposed as a restoration, as a compensation, is that there can be a massive planting of mangrove trees in order to protect the coastline so they don't have to displace once again. They say that every five years they have to move their houses because of the big erosion that is happening there. And then they are saying, like, you have to maybe build hard infrastructure with a technically right diagnostic, but also enable a restitution process around land tenure coming from the transitional justice process, and also a restoration measure of massive plantations of mangrove trees. So in this case, they will be taking into account actively measures of peace making, such as these reparation measures. This will raise their resilience towards this case of climate change. And then another case is the recognition of a river that was recognized from the special jurisdiction of peace as a victim of the armed conflict. And of course, you cannot say that the nature is subject to rights and that nature doesn't have a voice per se. So it was an initiative coming from the communities that were living across the river to say the Kaukaruri is, is a victim in a process of recovering the river. It's also a process of recovering our way of life. And then the third case, which is really close to my heart because I was present there, is from former combatants to eco guides. So it was a process that happened in the south of Colombia, in the entry point of the Amazon. And this is something that happened that after the peace agreement, some areas that were previously inaccessible because of the security reasons now open for biological research. So in this case, there was a biological expedition where farmers that were affected by the conflict, former combatants, bike rangers who were also affected by the conflict, and scientists, they all gathered together to analyze deforestation drivers, but also to make summary and inventory of the species that were there in this previously inaccessible land in order to establish tools and to develop skills to manage the protected area. So this is happening in the buffer zone of a protected area. And this collective of former combatants are saying, we are committed to protect this area as a way to recompensate the damage that we did during armed conflict. So I had the opportunity to participate in the beginning of this expedition. And you can really see how the environment and then the nature becomes like an entry point to establish trust, to establish dialogue between previous conflicted parties. Yeah, that is fascinating. I'll definitely be skipping the bananas tomorrow for breakfast because I have the whole picture now. Well, we, I guess we can say that for most of the foods we eat. Very interesting. There's so many things you could say about all these examples. Speaking as a person who was not well acquainted with the concepts of transitional and restorative justice, one of the things that I find fascinated about all of this that you both have been explaining, to put it in very layman's <laughs> words and really to oversimplify it, I guess, are these kind of bridges that you build between, you have on the one hand, things that are difficult to define and to measure, right? Things such as values and connections and transforming that, translating that into something tangible like reparation or a specific land use. And that's just one of the fascinating things for me, at least. But now if we start looking towards the solution side of things, my next question is to you, Valeria, and it pertains to the role that initiatives can play on this. In what ways can initiatives that incorporate the symbolic importance of the community's territories, how can they serve as tangible forms of reparation for communities impacted by violence, and at the same time also facilitating the social and economic integration of ex-combatants? And maybe as a follow-up question that you can already integrate into your answer, if possible, how can this be or can this be a good starting point for indigenous communities to be given due attention to their special connection with the land, with their territory, to initiate an effective reconciliation process among individuals and communities that are affected by violence? It's really important to think and dialogue about all these concepts, all these initiatives. And I think one first important thing to say is that we have to understand reparation, the big concept of reparation, not only landed in an object, an initiative, a final result, but as in a process. Reparation, it's built 
in this process and in the participation and dialogic process with the victims. So maybe you can have a really, really, really good and big initiative, but if you didn't ask this to the people and people doesn't agree or is not important for their circumstances, so the object is going to lose all the reparation potential. So the first step is to talk, to have dialogues, to sit in a very humble position, to listen, to ask and listen, what does these groups, these people, these communities have to say? I have to say about the harm. I have to say about the implications of the violence in their lives and in their whole lives, not only a very little clinical thing like I have anxiety. No, what happened with my family, with my relations, with my neighborhood, with my life project, with my cosmovision, with my everything, with my way to think about the future and the way to think about the institutions and listen all of this and trying to build together potentially healing spaces that allows the people to find their own path to restorative process. Second, it's important to say that both have to be in these initiatives. We need environmental initiatives, yes, of course, but we cannot ignore that they're not only like the environment in other place and the people in this place. We're not separated. And third, I think we have to also have a really wide understanding of the violence, but also the perpetrators. Because it's not the same to say ex-combatants and ex-military. Because the ex-combatants, they are private. Yes, they are private people. They're not institutional representatives. So I'm not saying that the violence is less important or does less harm. Of course not. But the harm that's been done from another person that's a neighbor or people from another community or someone but has not institutional suit, it's really different than the violence that's made from people that represent the state. So ex-military, they are people that we pay taxes to the state so they can pay for the military. So their task is to protect, their job is to protect. And when you are harmed from this kind of agents, the violence have a very different impact. So I think we have to approach differently on these initiatives, thinking what things have to do the perpetrators, taking in account that it's not the same having ex-combatants than ex-military. Perfect. And I think before we kind of look a little bit more to the future and different lessons, I mean, you've already touched quite a bit on these kind of healing and rehabilitation of victims of violence, highlighting this dialogue as a need for a starting point and building these potential healing spaces for people to choose the next steps and actually come to solutions that fit the needs for these communities are affected. Before we go on, do you have any examples of some of these dialogues or different decisions that have been taken as a result of actually bringing these communities together? Yes, I think in this special experience that the HEP has been, I think it's really important that the HEP has indigenous judges, judges that are from a lot of indigenous communities. So they know because they grow up there and they know about the customs, about the rituals, about the ceremonies, about the special symbolic connection with the lands and the territories. So that's on one hand, and it's very important to have spaces in this kind of mechanisms of people from all backgrounds, including people from indigenous communities. So that's one very, very good practice from the HEP. And in other hand, the HEP is really open, I think, to ask these questions, to have a peer-to-peer -peer dialogue, to try to build the best way possible these initiatives from the perspective of the victims and from the perspective of the communities. So I think that's a second important thing. And sometimes this implies that we maybe are not going to have a sentence that says, yeah, we have to have a reforestation project, 
but we have to have a ritual where the perpetrators ask for forgiveness, not only for the victim, but for the whole community and ask for permission and apologies to the land and everything that the land represents, because it's not only the physical stuff that you have in the land, like the plants and the river and the trees and the animals, but also the symbolic beings that live in the land, the ancestors, the gods, every community have a different cosmovision. For a lot of indigenous communities, the violence is not only the direct violence that we can see, like homicide and forced disappearance, but also it's about the unbalance that the violence caused. And we have to recover the balance, not only have a legal sentence of the enforced disappears. Now let's look to the future. While we have spoken quite a bit today about transitional justice and reparation, but also reconciliation and rehabilitation. And to my understanding, these were measures applicable to a post-conflict context. But as was pointed out, even though the conflict between the FARC and the government has officially ended with the peace accord in 2016, conflict has now taken new forms. And we also know that there are serious abuses continuously going on in Colombia. So what does that mean? What does this ongoing nature of conflict mean for transitional justice? So this is a question for both of you. Yeah, that's a, that question right now. So... Adelphi has worked in Colombia, uh, producing a really interesting report uh, called A Dangerous Climate, which was undertaken in 2021. And it was because at the moment there was a crisis on environmental defenders being killed in the Amazon. Now the violence has mutated in Colombia. And although it is not just to be 30 years ago with this, Colombia was almost a failed state during the narco violence. So we haven't advanced, but there is not peace, especially in the most far away rural communities. So it's really difficult to take the boat with transitional justice as it sinks. So there are two challenges, but also a way of hope. The biggest challenge lies in the warranties of non-repetition. Seeing transitional justice or left table, so which is truth, justice, repatriation, and then non-repetition. And of course, if you are maybe being compensated, but then you are re-victimized again, it is not going to work. So if you talk to rural communities, they did not oppose to the peace agreement when there was this referendum. They were saying, we just want to live in peace and we need as a way of reparation with a normal state. So education, health, basic services. So that's one of the best ways to compensate the victims is just to have the essential services, essential public services, and then the tranquility that not another armed actor is going to enter into the territory and is going to threaten us. So this is the way that transitional justice can be transformative even during conflict. So changing the logic of the the economic logics of the conflict. Yeah, and I think it's really important also to recontextualize in which conditions the work of the head is taking place now, because yeah, it's true. We're in a dangerous place and the violence is changing its dynamics, but not every group is participating or even agrees with this. This is one point. Another one is that some of the actors that they are participating, maybe sometimes we've learned, we've read I hear in, in some media that they're like disappointed of the work that's been done in the institutions, not because this is bad work, not at all, but because, for example, the work of the head, it's a work that's going to last like a couple of years, a couple of more years. So it's really slow and it's being built in the road and maybe they don't have all the answers. They're trying to do their best. But of course, for the people, for the perpetrators that they're participating, for the groups that they're participating and for the victims, Maybe they would want faster results and they have to wait to see something that maybe uh, repair their damage and their harms. So this is another hand. A third point is that the HEP is not responsible for the current security context and the HEP is not responsible for all the reparation initiatives in the country. So, of course, if we don't have an articulated 
mechanisms and institutions is going to be really difficult. But even though they are articulated, a lot of institutions doing all this work is going to be tough and it's going to be slow. And a fourth important point is that we have a country in a region, in a continent, that will live systemic violence. So maybe all these mechanisms are really, really, really good mechanisms, and they're trying to do their best. But if in this process we don't touch and we don't change the structural violence, for example, as Hector said, the military approach to address conflict, any mechanism is going to be really little because the structural violence and the people that's continuing and getting more profound this violence continues there. So I think, yes, we are in a very risky context and all the results and the good results that we've achieved, I think they are in risk too. We've seen in this world how easy it is to go backwards. I would want to really highlight and resonate what Valeria said on coordination because we have like really symbolic and really exemplary laws. So for example, the one that I named the compensation to victims laws, but then there is still a, a lack of proper structure of the state to arrive to these territories. And I want to highlight two things. That is, this is an agreement that was signed from the Colombian state. So any government that comes to power should respect these peace accords and implement the measures, which was not the case during the former government because it left one of the most difficult parts to implement was their agrarian reform, which has a lot to do with the environment and with a proper balance between natural resource use and economic production. And then the international dimension, because unfortunately, the so-called war on drugs does not depend only on Colombia. And there is this sense of co-responsibility from the global north, where I want to highlight that the narco-traffic in Colombia has been a source of income for illegal armed groups, but also for the Colombian government. Because what happened was that the war on drugs was kind of outsourced by the United States mostly, saying like we need to cut the cocaine production on the source, but this has not worked for the last 40 years. So it was a huge investment from the US government, but nowadays the production of cocaine is still constant. And now there is another multinational crime. So now the Mexicans are more involved in the commercialization, so to say, but also there is corruption in the global north, in the havens. There is not a proper address of the way illegal drugs are commercialized in the global north. So it's really easy to get illicit drugs either in the States or in Europe. Also, there is not a proper approach of health policy. So the consumption is reduced. So there's a huge demand in the global north. So this is also a huge part of the equation of the armed conflict in Colombia from the border of the United States and to here. So it also has to do with the environment. You know, there is several studies called narco deforestation, which is not only a legal crop production, but also land access to different uses, which in a laundry of money coming from narco traffic. But maybe that's another episode. Maybe stay tuned for a follow-up in the future. Thanks so much to both of you for sharing all of this insight and these knowledge throughout the episode. One thing, as you've directly talked about, this international dimension, specifically at the end, in the case of the responsibilities of other countries and their role in some of this conflict, and specifically drug production, looking at kind of the international debate, not necessarily the role of other countries in the Colombian case, but when it comes to the Colombian case, what does this bring to the international debate regarding, maybe Hector, you can speak a little bit to the international humanitarian law perspective and what other countries can learn from these conversations on transitional justice. And maybe Valeria, you can speak a little bit to what other countries in different contexts other people working on these topics of transitional justice and reconciliation can take from the Colombian case in terms of empowering victims and survivors and the psychosocial support that's needed for victims. Maybe Hector, if you want to kick yeah. us off and then we'll close with Valeria. Yeah, thanks. I would say that the international humanitarian law does recognize the protection of the environment and 
crimes against the environment, but it is kind of outdated, if I, if I say so. So um, while the International Criminal Court requires legal person recognition for victims, this special jurisdiction for police approach have a less formal recognition of crimes against nature, and it also enhances it by recognizing cultural aspects involving the norm that protects places of cult. So, for example, the Hague Convention establishes a cultural good of importance for the people's cultural heritage, and the places of cult are normally monuments, buildings, like human infrastructures, but then it can be enhanced towards places of cult that are natural, which is something that is being now recognized by the HEP. And is, for example, a sacred mountain, you know, what it entails, the cosmovision of a territory, a river could be a place of cult. So in that sense, this could be building the jurisprudence of international law. Also, the HEP's interpretation prohibits attacks causing short-term environmental damage, which is not the case in the a wrong statue because it's like more prolonged environmental damage. So, for example, the one case within the help is the damage against oil infrastructure and to comprehend this as a tactic from the guerrillas to build this threat against the Colombian state and the finances. So it was a more complete understanding of the role of nature within the whole environmental conflict. And another thing that I would like to highlight is that, for example, there are many initiatives in Colombia where environmental collectives, farmer collectives, they are collecting data on water ecosystems, on environmental data, so they can then build up demands in tribunal justice to build the law cases. I think this is interesting and important, for example, from a climate justice perspective at the global level, how this data can be collected to present cases against multinational corporations that are not complying with what has been signed at the COP, for example, or with the national contributions to climate mitigation, etc. So this is all kind of learnings that can be scaled up to a global debate. Well, about the question asked to me, I would like to start saying that from the global south, even when we talk about victim-centered approach and healing processes, we prefer not to use anymore the empower or empowering concept because this term, and it's not that this is bad, you know, but this term contributes to an idea that we are on an imbalance of power relation because why do I have to empower another person? It's giving a power to another one that doesn't have it. So we prefer to call or use the term to reconnect with the agency that everyone already has. And I think it's important to have these discussions because it's part of the process. It's part of the healing process, the reconciliation processes, and the restorative justice and transitional justice processes. Second of all, I think it's really important to promote a victim-centered approach and this has to be the essence of the processes. And I think in Colombia, we have a very interesting and rich example of trying to have this approach on the center, the victim center approach on the center of the transitional justice mechanisms. And I think we have to learn a lot of this. For far too long, victims were not even seen as the central actor of any justice processes. So now doing this is a really like pilot experience, but a really big pilot experience that maybe can help us all to build better transitional justice processes. But one thing that's important also is that when we work with victims and when we talk about healing processes, it's not have to be conceived from a Western clinical perspective, but from an indigenous perspective, an ethnical perspective, a communitarian perspective, a global South perspective. So we don't put the emphasis on a depression and anxiety, PTSD, but the unbalance that's being provoked to the land, to the life of the people, to the communities from the violence. So these initiatives doesn't have to go, if we're thinking of healing, this doesn't go to have a psychologist or psychiatrist or medical experts or clinical experts, but to have these dialogues with the people to know what the people need to heal, what the people need to recover the harmony and the balance 
of their own lives and in their lands with their communities. And this is really, really important. And, and last, one of the lessons is that we have to rely on a humble approach. And this is really key on these initiatives because, yes, we are maybe experts in a theoretical point of view, but I don't live in the community. And I'm not an Afro-Colombian woman, and I haven't lived the armed conflict myself. So victims are the experts on their own experiences, in their own harm and in their own lives. And we have to go with a humble approach to build this initiative. So transitional justice needs to take this into account so we can build a truthful and a really useful restorative and reparation initiatives. And I think maybe Colombia, yes, is learning is learning on the road and uh, there are going to be a lot of mistakes, but also there are going to be a lot of lessons. And I think already we have a lot of lessons of the initiatives that Colombian it's making. Thank you so much. Wow, you've unpacked so much. It's going to be difficult to summarize everything. First of all, I love this last sentence you said, victims are the experts. I think you gave us a title for the podcast. This is just very interesting to hear from both of you. It was great to have both your experiences, your different perspectives complementing each other and all the examples that you've shared. I'm sure our listeners will appreciate this masterclass on transitional and restorative justice. Our guests Valeria Patricia Muscoso Ursua and Hector Morales Munoz walked us through the concept of transitional and restorative justice why it is needed, and how to best apply these processes to benefit populations whose lives were affected by conflict. We've learned that issues of land access and governments are at the heart of the Colombian conflict and a key driver of violence. Land is both essential for access to vital economic resources and the spiritual and identity backbone of communities. Violence against territories is therefore often equated with violence against people. We've heard that Colombia's special jurisdiction for peace mission already includes affirmative action for marginalized groups and acknowledges the need for territorial approaches. Valeria and Hector also highlighted that reparation must be understood as a process rather than an outcome. It involves listening to and collecting communities' perspectives on the harm inflicted upon them and opening healing spaces for victims to establish dialogue that enable communities to walk their own path toward justice. There are several initiatives already that show how projects targeting the environment are becoming an entry point for building trust between various formerly conflicting parties. And looking at the future and what kind of lessons can be drawn from Colombia, we've learned that measures must target the most economically vulnerable to the conflict in order to achieve a truly transformative character. It must avoid re-victimization, facilitate intercommunal agreement, and even address the satisfaction with the peace process itself. There's a general need for a change in military logic, focusing more on community protection and structural violence rather than traditional securitization narratives. Victims must become central actors in transitional justice processes, and there is a need to enhance the formal recognition of crimes against nature to better incorporate long-term environmental damage into international legal frameworks and to expand the definition of places of cult to include natural assets such as rivers. Thank you so much to both of you, Valeria and Hector. Also special thanks to Olivier Clavé from Justice Rapid Response on making this episode possible and all the coordination and the input that he gave into the concept. And also my special thanks to my co-host Alexandra, who took this over while I was away on vacation. <laughs> so I didn't have my finger in this one as much as I normally do, as I normally like to have. So special thanks to everyone. You all did such a great job in putting together this great, super informative episode. And this was the Climate Diplomacy Podcast. We will be back with another episode in a few weeks, as we usually do. Follow our latest updates on Twitter and LinkedIn. Thank you for tuning in. And until next time, goodbye. Goodbye.